Greetings to everyone. Welcome to the Logos, a Bible study program brought to you by the Assembly of Yahusha. Our topic for today, what Yahusha teaches about wealth and money. Now, before we go ahead and proceed to our studies, let us first offer this prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious Abba Yahuwah, thank you so much for the life and strength that we have and the opportunity to be able to study your holy words together. We worship you, O loving Abba, because you are our creator who loves each and every one of us so much. Our King Yahushua, we also proclaim our love for you. We worship you in spirit and truth. We ask that you please be with us as we focus on your teachings on the Sermon on the Mount. Especially today, we, we will look into your study concerning wealth. May you guide our thoughts and our hearts and may you move us, O loving King, to have more faith in you and the Father. Father, we believe that you have listened to our prayers. We ask and beg everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahusha HaMashiach. Amen. All right, gracious be to our loving Father that we are able again to study his words and his commands. Welcome to the Logos. This Bible study program is focused on looking into, investigating, and expounding upon the teachings of our loving King, Yahusha HaMashiach, about certain topics, about certain subjects that is very, very relevant to our life today. And so today we will continue our study on the teaching of our king that he presented on the, the mount. We have been on the Sermon of, on the Mount for quite some time, and we will continue to look into his teachings. Last week, we talked about his teachings concerning prayer and fasting. Today, we're going to look at what Yahushua taught about money. And it turns out that Yahushua taught about money, about wealth, more than any other subject. Because when you look at many of the parables of our King Yahushua, it focuses on money. So money is something that is relevant to our life. I'm sure you are aware of this because money is something we need because without it, we can basically do nothing. And so it is an important topic and our King Yahushua recognizes the relevance of money and wealth when it comes to our life. And so he teaches about this subject many, many times. And it turns out our attitude toward wealth and also how we spend our wealth and money, it reveals much about the condition of our heart and our faith. This is why it's important for us as we study this subject together to reflect upon our heart, to reflect upon our mind, and the level of faith or maturity of spirituality that we are at at the present moment. And so let's go ahead and begin our studies here in the book of Matthew 6, 19 down to 21. This is what our King Yahusha opens up with. Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven. For moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And so this is the first installment of Yahushua's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount about wealth, about money. He begins by saying, do not store up treasures here on earth. Now, what does our king teach us here? What is this all about? Is our king Yahushua? teaching us that we should not have savings or that it's wrong and a sin to invest our wealth. Is Yahusha teaching against savings? Because when he says, do not store up treasures here on earth, it appears that that is what he is teaching. However, when we look at the scriptures, when we look at the whole body of the word of God, the Old Testament, the New Testament, it teaches us the following about money. In the book of Proverbs 13, verse 11, Dishonest money dwindles away, but he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. And so we know Yahuwah has nothing against making money grow. In fact, it's a wise thing to do. And it's also expected for us to be able to grow our wealth, grow our money, so that we can be considered a righteous or good man. In the book of Proverbs 13.22, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. But a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. The Bible tells us that when it comes to the acquisition of wealth, 
Yahuwah is not against that. And so when the Bible teaches about wealth, it doesn't forbid us or prohibit us from having savings and even engaging in investments. In the book of Matthew 25, 14 and 15, 26, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops, I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. And so here our king gives a parable about the kingdom of heaven. Now, when it comes to a parable, of course, the main teaching is not always the literal aspect of the parable. And so our king Yahusha is not teaching about investing here. However, he uses investing on earth as the way in which to convey a message about the kingdom. So this tells us our king Yahusha does not forbid, but looks favorably upon wise use of money, which includes investments and savings. And so when we look at the collective body of the Holy Scriptures concerning what it teaches about wealth and wealth management, we know 619 is not a blanket prohibition against savings and investments. What it requires is for us to look with wisdom so that we can apply properly the teaching of our king, Yahusha. And so what does it mean when our king, Yahusha, says, don't store up treasures here on earth? Well, we need to focus on the word treasure. Notice our king, Yahusha, did not say, don't store up money here on earth. What is he saying? Don't store up treasures here on earth. You see, the word treasures here surely involves possessions, but it's not the same as possessions. Instead, it refers to the accumulation of things as a focus of joy. It refers to the spirit of acquisitiveness or the desire to acquire. In other words, it's a type of acquisition which is the equivalent of greed and covetousness. And so what our King Yahusha is teaching is against uh, greed and covetousness. Yahusha is concerned with the insatiable longing for more of material possessions. And because of this, well, they no longer are content with what they have. And so there's an absence uh, of trust in God, our Father, who promises to supply all needful, all needful things to his children. So when our King Yahusha says that when it comes to money, or when it comes to treasures, when he says do not store treasures on earth, he's not referring to money per se. Money per se is needed in life because without it, there's nothing we can do. However, we should make sure that money does not become our treasure. You see, money becomes our treasure when we begin to love it. You see the difference? We need money, but we should not love money. There's a big difference. Hebrews 13 verse 5 teaches, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And so treasure is considered what you desire with your heart. And so it involves this affection, this emotion called love. And so when a person begins to love money, that's the problem. When your treasure is your money, then you are storing treasure on earth. Now, how can we tell if a person loves money? Well, they're never content with what they have. And so what do they do? They accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. They add more and more and more to their savings. In other words, they're not willing to let go of that money. So their money or their wealth has possession of them. 
And so they're no longer stewards of the money that Yahuwah God has blessed them with. In that context, they are loving money because they cannot get enough of it. So in Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 21, Yahusha is not talking about what we have, the money we have. He's talking about our attitude toward what we have. This is why Yahusha taught on the subject of money more than any other subject, because money has this powerful effect to destroy our life. And so he warns us about the power of money, the destructive power of money, if we are not careful and if we do not apply wisdom. And so we'll go over in this teaching of our King Yahusha three reasons why money can be powerfully dangerous. What is reason number one? Take a look at verse 21 of the passage that we read. When Yahusha says, don't store up treasures here on earth, verse 21, he says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of the heart will also be. Now, I want you to think about that statement. Typically, a person might say or expect where your heart is, there your treasure will be. But what Yahushua says is different. He says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. You know what I think is teaching us here? He's teaching us whatever we consider to be our treasure, our heart will go in that direction. And so if our treasure is here on earth, our heart will be focused on this earth. If our treasure will be there in heaven, our heart will be focused on heaven. And so we need to be wise when it comes to choosing what we call our treasure. What do we value the most? Is it heavenly things or is it earthly things? Is it material things or is it spiritual things? Because whatever we value the most, guess what? Our heart is going to go in that direction. You see, what we do with our money doesn't simply show where our hearts are, according to Yahusha, it determines where our hearts go. Your heart will follow your treasure. What you treasure determines a lot about you. And so holding money as a treasure will shape your heart and the direction of your life. Money has the power to shape the course of one's life. And so that's danger number one. That's power number one for money. Money has the power to direct the course of your life. What else is another power, dangerously power attribute that money has? In the book of Matthew 6, 22, 23, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light, and if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. And so at, from talking about storing riches or storing treasures and then jumping to your eye is like a lamb, what our King Yahushua is teaching us is how our perception of things has an effect on the choices we make in our life. And the choices we make in our life affects us deeply, right? And so it begins with our perception. That's why he says, your eye is like a lamb. And that means our eye is used to perceive things. And so when our eye is healthy, if your perception is correct, you properly value the things that are given to us for example, we know spiritual is higher is more valuable than material, or heavenly riches is more valuable than earthly riches. When we have the proper perspective of the things that we have, if we have the proper perspective and the proper valuation of the blessings that we have, we're going to be okay. Because if we have the if our eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with. Like, on the other hand, if your value system is wrong, your priority system is wrong, in other words, if your eye is unhealthy, so what God considers to be valuable, you consider not valuable, and what God considers to be not as you think of as the most important thing on earth, 
then you're going to have a problem because it's going to affect the entire your entire body or your entire life. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. Now, when this is applied to money, it simply means money changes the way we see things. Money can cloud our vision. Is that true? Yeah. It has the power to blind a person to what's really important, which takes us to number two. Money has the power to blind us from seeing what is truly valuable in our life. This is why many people spend so much time pursuing money. They do not even realize it's taking a toll in the things that are more valuable like worshiping God, like loving our family, spending time with our family, enjoying life's provisions, enjoying the Sabbath. And so when it comes to money, money has this power to blind us so that we don't engage in activities that support what is more important than the acquisition of wealth. This is why if we're not careful and money blinds us, we end up doing things that bring us or plunge us into darkness. This is why love for money will bring a person into a, a dark moment or dark experiences in his or her life. If you so remember the warning of the Apostle Paul, which is connected to what our King Yahusha teaches here, he got it from this teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, Apostle Paul says in Timothy 6, 9 to 10, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. And so Apostle Paul, take note, he's teaching against the love of for money, for the love of money. He's not teaching against money. He's not against money. The Bible's not against money. The Bible's not against wealth. But what the Bible warns us about is the love of money. Because when you love money, that money becomes your treasure. And so when money becomes your treasure, when you develop a love of care for money, it becomes very, very dangerous because it blinds you from seeing the more important things. And so what ends up happening? People fall into temptation. They're trapped by many foolish and harmful desires. This is why many people, because of the pursuit to get, to get more and more money, sometimes they end up in jail, sometimes they get killed. And oftentimes people who all they think about is acquiring wealth, they forsake their loved ones, their spouse, their children. And so they may be materially wealthy, but they're miserable in their life. And so they fall into temptation. They pierce themselves with many sorrows and they end up ruined and in destruction. In other words, because they could not see that there are much more things more important than money, the darkness of their perception led to the darkness of their whole body. And so they end up in ruin and destruction. This is why money can be dangerous. Number one, it has the power to direct the course of your life. And so we need to make sure we make the right decision about money. Number two, money is also able to blind us from seeing what is truly valuable. But how else can money be powerfully dangerous? Let's read the book of Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other or else you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. How else can money be dangerous for us when we make money serve as though it is mammon, right? Because the Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve to master. So when we make money our master, then that's a big problem because money is going to enslave us. And when we are enslaved by money, we cannot worship and properly serve Yahuwah. You know, 
It's interesting that our King Yahweh should chose the word mammon when he says you cannot serve God and mammon. Some linguistic scholars associate the term mammon with a Syrian deity, a god of riches, and so it, they use it as a, pron a, a, a proper noun, like capital M, A M M O N. And the term mammon is often used as a pejorative, a term that was used to describe gluttony, excessive materialism, greed, and unjust worldly gain. And so it's depicted as a false god, as an idol. In other words, when we love money, when money becomes our master, it becomes a false god. It becomes an idol. And money is intoxicating. I mean, even in the United States, what do you call the dollar, right? You call it the mighty dollar. Is it the mighty dollar? The almighty dollar. You, you print in your, you, they print in the dollar in God we trust. And at the same time, they call money, uh, they, they refer to the dollar as the almighty dollar. Very ironic. So when money becomes your master, instead of a servant, it becomes mammon and idol. And it can be intoxicating. This is why another translation of Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve God in mammon. In the NLT translation, it says you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. And so when money becomes a master, it becomes mammon. When money becomes an idol or mammon, it means you're enslaved by money. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is this, is money our servant or is it our master? Are we so tightly closed in our hold of money that we're not willing to let go? That's why some people are called tight-fisted, right? They cannot let go of money. Why? Because that's your master. And so we need to have a loose hold on money. That's the way. I mean, it's, uh, we should hold it because we don't want to spend and spend unwisely and end up because and end up being driven to poverty, we have to find the, the right the right way to hold it, right? Hold it, but not too tightly. Hold it because it's not your master. It is your servant. You put it to good use. The Bible says we are stewards, stewards of the things that we have been given. What does it mean to be a steward? A steward means we understand what we have been given is not really ours. Whose is it? It's God's. The money we have, it's not really ours. We're just asked to manage it. And so we are to put it to good use according to how God sees fit. And so that's a steward. Are we being stewards of the blessing God has given us? Or are we trying to take over what God has given us and say to ourselves, "I this money belongs to me. In that case, you're already possessed by your Money. You're a servant of that money. We are stewards. We have to put it to good use. Well, how can we know? I mean, how can we know if our money is our servant or it is our master? Let's find out. The book of Matthew 19, 21, 22. Yahushua told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. What we read about is this man who was rich. And take note, this rich man is the one who took the initiative to go to our king, Yahusha. And he asked our king, Yahusha, good teacher, what do I need to do to possess everlasting life? And Yahusha says, well, you have to obey the Ten Commandments. And so he said, I've been doing that. No problem. And then Yahweh says, now there's something else I want you to do. He's, he's actually going to, he's calling this young man, this rich man, to be a personal disciple. Perhaps he could have been a, another apostle. This is a golden opportunity. <clears throat> I mean, how many of you would want to be in the position of this rich man? Because you're going to get a personal call to become a personal disciple. To be one of the inner people of our King Yahusha. Isn't that what he would want? This opportunity was presented to him. All he had to do was what? Sell all his possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Follow me, he says. But then, was he able to do this? 
No, he went away sad. And the reason why is because he had many possessions. In other words, his true God, his true master, was what? His possessions, his riches. In other words, he was possessed by his possessions. And so he could not let go of that. He was possessed by that. That was his master. And so he could not go and follow Yahusha to be his new master. So he had to make a choice. Who really is my master? Is it Yahusha or is it Mammon? For him, it was Mammon. And so he could not follow King Yahusha. And so, brethren, we should not let our possessions possess us. And so how can we recognize a true servant of God who is not possessed by their possessions? Well, in the book of Proverbs 3, 9 to 10, honor Yahuwah with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. And he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. So according to scriptures, how can we truly, truly show that Yahuwah and Yahusha, they are our masters and wealth is not our master. Well, we do not allow wealth to ruin and to be a competitor to our devotion to God and our worship of God. This is why there are many, I mean, if you are a true servant of God and you truly love God and you truly love Yahusha, well, you're going to observe the Sabbath, right? And in the Sabbath, it means you cannot earn money for a living on a Sabbath. And we have many members in the Assembly of Yahushua who has sacrificed much because they could not take that overtime or they could not take a certain job because they wanted to honor Yahuwah and Yahushua. They wanted to honor Sabbath. And so that tells us that they are, the, the one they consider their master is who? Yahuwah and Yahusha. Also, they honor Yahuwah with their wealth. Unlike the rich man who could not sacrifice his wealth, the true people of God are able to sacrifice their wealth to honor who? Yahuwah. Why? Because they know it's not really theirs. Whose is it? It's really whose? Yahuwah's. And so, beloved brethren, we have to be aware of the, the power the destructive power that money has over human beings. Now, where do you suppose money gets its power from? Why is money so intoxicating that people will die for it? People will live for it. People will do anything for it, even forsake the true master. What, where does the power of money come from? I think our King Yahushua answers that question in the book of Matthew 6, verse 25. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, is it life more than food and your body more than clothing? Or do you suppose this intoxicating power that money has over people come from? It comes from a misperception or misunderstanding about what life really is all about. I mean, for many people, what is life to them? For many people, life is only about life here on earth, right? Do you think life is just this physical life that we have? And so just like the animals, just like the plants, well, you need to have food, you need to have drink, you need to have clothes, you need to have shelter, so on and so forth, the basic, basic necessities of life, right? And so for them, life is just that. And so if... You have food and drink and clothes. They think once you have that, you have everything you need. You're going to be perfectly happy. But what does Yahweh just say? Is, is, is it life more than food? And your body more than clothing? Our King Yahweh is just telling us, wake up. Open your eyes. Don't let the darkness ruin your eyes. Don't let the darkness ruin you. We need to see life for what it is. Life is more than the physical thing we see on earth. It's so much more than that. You see, if life on earth is all that there is, then of course, your master should be money, right? If all that there is in life are the things on earth, money should be your master. It, 
makes perfect sense because with money, you can get food. With money, you can get drink. With money, you can get nice clothes, right? But wait a minute, money is not, I mean, life is not just about food and drink and clothes. It's a lot more. But because many people have this understanding that all the rest of life is life here on earth, well then they begin to worry about the things of this life. And so they begin to worry, how am I going to get that food, that drink, clothes? Is it important to get food, drink, and clothes? Yes. Is it important to have money? Yes. But don't worry about it. And so one of the things I want to ask is, do we have a worry problem? Do you have a worry problem about the things in this life? I mean, if we're going to be honest, I think some of us might say, yeah, especially when there's poverty, there's hardship, right? I mean, if the whole world is engulfed in poverty and hardship, when people everywhere are losing their jobs, of course you're going to be worried, right? It's perfectly normal to be worried, I think. However, when you feel worry, it, it, it predisposes you to love and to trust money. Those who have a worry problem about life, they're predisposed to be easily converted to the religion of money. Why? Because they think that the problem of life on earth is all that there is. This is why to correct this misunderstanding, to correct this wrong notion about money and about life on earth, what does Yahusha teach? What is the way for us to overcome money so that we can protect ourselves from the power of money when it comes to influencing people? Matthew 6, 26 to 27, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Our King Yahushua says, don't worry. And there's one simple and obvious reason, but for many of us, it's not really obvious. There's one simple reason why we should not be worried about the things we need in this life. You know what it is? What's that one reason? What does Yahushua teach? Why we should never be worried? He's speaking to Christians here, his disciples, his followers. What is one reason? We have a father. Who is our father? The one who created all things. He's our father. And so Yahweh is teaching look at the birds. I mean, if the father feeds the birds, aren't you more important than the birds? And so what we need to do is remember our relationship with our God. Yahuwah is our father. Do you trust your father? Do you have faith in your father? If so, I mean, be concerned when you lost your job, but don't be overwhelmed by worry. Why? Because Yahweh is going to find a way. I mean, it doesn't mean you're going to be lazy. You're going to look for work, but what you cannot do, you endorse to whose care? The father. And so we should not worry about that. What else? Matthew 26, uh, 6, 28 to 30. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Okay, Yamsha is teaching us here, um, don't worry even about clothing. I mean, I think for many of us, what we're more concerned about more than clothing is food and drink. I mean, if you're at that, that level of uh, poverty level, what you wear, you're not really too, you're not really too concerned about. But Arkin Yahusha is teaching us something here that it really did not dawn on me until just now. <laughs> you know what it is? Yahusha is teaching us that the Father cares about you. In fact, he cares about you. He will give you food and drink that you need. Also, He's even going to give things that you don't really need. I mean, he doesn't want us to live like beasts. He understands we're human beings. And so even our clothing, right? And how our clothing looks like. 
is under our Father's care. That's amazing. What Archangel is teaching us when it comes to our needs that the Father is going to give us, it's not just subsistence. He wants us to be above that a little bit. <laughs> you know, it's not like, it's not like having the, like bare bread and water. He wants us to have even a little bit of, to be more comfortable than complete subsistence living. You understand what I'm saying? And so our King Yemen says, don't worry. If the father is clothing the lilies of the field and what this lilies are dressed with is more glorious than Solomon's clothing, but he's telling us, don't worry about what your needs are. Yahweh is going to satisfy your needs. And you're not going to want anything else. You're not going to want for more. Because Yahweh is going to fulfill everything that we can ever need. That's why he says, why do you have so little faith? And so, beloved brethren, for us to be able to shake off the intoxicating power of money... Bible says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So the antidote to worry is to trust who? God. How do you trust God? He's our father. Well, what can we expect with God being our father? Not only will he give us the things we need, he will satisfy us with the things that we need. And so we need to just place our hope and trust in the Father. And so what does our King Yahusha teach us as a principle to, to live by, to kind of put everything together? When he taught about money, he begins with the problem of making money your treasures. So because if that's the case, it becomes our master or our mammon, and it destroys our life. And so now he presents the solution to all this. What is that? Here it is. This is the principle that our King Yahushua wants to teach us about money. Here it is. What principle should we live by? Matthew 6, 31 to 34. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And so what's the solution to worry? So that we can shake off the influencing power of money. Our King Yahushua says, don't worry about these things. Instead, this is what you ought to do. What did he say? Seek the kingdom of God above all else. In other words, seek the kingdom of God and make it our priority, our topmost priority, and live righteously. And so if we follow this principle, seek seeking the kingdom of God above all else, and living righteously, what is the promise? He will give you everything you need. You see that? This is what our King Yahusha wants to tell us. Now, does it mean this is an excuse to be lazy? Because some people might think after reading this passage, seek the kingdom of God, live righteously, everything else will be added to me. In other words, I, all I need to do is pray all day. <laughs> is that what Yahweh is teaching? Just pray all day? No. He's telling us not to be lazy. He's telling us to work hard. Why? Because he says live. One of the righteous things to do is to work hard for the sake of the kingdom, to work hard for the sake of our life, to work hard for the sake of the people who depend on us. And so it's not a, an excuse to become lazy. No. Rather, it is a reason for us to be industrious and to work hard. Why? Because we want to live righteously. Because if we're not working hard for a living, we become, uh, we become beggars. That's not righteousness. Right? He wants us to give to beggars. That's righteousness. And so for that to happen, we have to work hard. We have to work wisely. But he also tells us, seek the kingdom of God above all else. So in the context of money, because this is what Matthew 6, 
19 to 33 is about. It's about money. It's about wealth. What Yahushua is teaching about money. And so when he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else, what does it mean? Well, we preach the kingdom of God. We serve in the kingdom of God. We tell people about the kingdom of God. How else can we seek the kingdom of God above all else? Well, in connection to the context of this whole passage, we go back to 19 and 21, when Yahushua says, store your treasures in heaven. And so when our King Yahushua says, don't store up treasures on earth, at the same time, he says, store your treasures in heaven. In other words, what you should value more than anything are the things that pertain to heaven. That includes what? The kingdom of God. And so when it comes to storing our treasures in heaven, what does that look like? What does that mean? Part of it is to honor Yahuwah with our wealth. That's why when Yahuwah blesses us with wealth, we are to use that wealth not to forget him, but to honor him with our wealth. In the Old Testament times, how did the people of God honor Yahuwah with their wealth? By giving the tithe. And so there was a set number that was expected. What was the purpose of the tithe? To support the work of the priests. Because the priests, well, they had no source of income. They had to be supported. During our time today, the principle still applies. The number 10%, of course, is not binding, but the principle and the spirit of, its, the, of that law, of that command, it still applies today. This is why when our King Yahushua says, seek the kingdom, Above all else, he is also telling us that we should financially support the kingdom of God. Well, how do you do that? How do you financially support the kingdom of God? Well, one way to seek the kingdom of God is by financially supporting active ministries. Like an active ministry that proclaims and rehearses the gospel. You see, there are many ministries that we can support financially. Because one of the ways... The expectation of God for his people is to support ministries financially because without financial support, well, how is that going to be sustained? In the assembly of Yahusha, we are truly thankful to the Father because he supports his ministry for the kindness of people who give. And, you know, that is to be expected. Yahuwah will provide. And we're thankful for those who give uh, to the assembly of Yahusha. But there's also other ministries. What are the ministries that we should support? The ministries that proclaim and rehearse the gospel. What do you mean? Well, those who support and those who seek the kingdom of God, they understand what the meaning of the kingdom of God is. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the restoration of God's rule over the earth. And so it's part of the complete gospel message. Do you know? What the complete gospel message is, many people only know the first part of the gospel message. What's the first part of the gospel message? Redemption. The death, burial, and resurrection of our king, Yahusha. Redemption. But is that all that there is to the gospel? No. There's also the work of one. Restoration. This is why the spirit was sent. This is why in the future, Yahusha is going to return and restore everything. So the gospel is about the work of redemption and restoration, preaching and rehearsing the Moedim. This is what we do in the assembly of Yahusha. And ministries like this should be financially supported by the people who are being served by the ministry. Is this what was practiced back then? Take a look at 2 Corinthians 9, 7 to 9. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God so loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all your need. That you will always have everything you need. And plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. And so when it comes to honoring Yahuwah with our wealth, when it comes to treasuring, setting our treasures in heaven, Apostle Paul reminds us, Yahuwah will never forget that kind of work. 
And so what is expected from those who worship Yahuwah and Yahusha? Bible says you must each decide in your heart how much to give. Before, it was already said. Whether you like it or not, you have to give 10%, right? Today, Bible says each must give according to one's heart. Or if you're going to give with your heart, well, that means you're going to plan it. You plan what you're going to give. You don't just make it up on the spot because if you do that, you're probably responding out of pressure. In advance, you determine what is my what is in my heart that I want to give. How can I show to Yahuwah that I trust not in wealth but in Him? Well, we already determine in advance what we're going to give according to our heart, so that when we give, we do so cheerfully. Yahuwah loves those who give cheerfully, not those who give out of pressure because somebody tells them, "Can you give?" This is why we don't do that in the assembly of Yahusha. It's up to you to give, right? The Bible says those who give, Yahuwah will not forget what they have done. They will always have everything that they will need and plenty left over to share with others. This is the promise of our Father. And so because of this, what does Apostle Paul also teach? Timothy 6, 17 to 19, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. This Apostle Paul is teaching we should be good stewards of our riches and wealth. How so? Don't trust. Don't love money. Why? Because they are uncertain. Instead, what should we do? Be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for ourselves a good foundation. Now, who is in the mind of the Apostle Paul? Well, in this passage, it's specifically those who are rich enough. Because there are people who have their needs met, and so they have savings. Like what we said. It's good, it's wise for you to have savings. But when we begin to budget what we receive, we have for our needs, we have for savings, are we also storing up for heaven? Are we also storing up a good foundation for the life that is to come? Is that part of our budgeting? Because that will determine what is in our heart. That will determine the level of our faith. Do we trust? In uncertain riches, or do we trust in the living God? Yahushua says, do not trust in uncertain riches, because riches, moths eat them, rust destroys them, thieves break in and steal. And the truth of the matter is, whatever we keep here on earth, when we die, you lost that forever. But what we store up in heaven, we keep that for the rest of our life. That's why Yahushua says, store treasures in heaven. Where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves and not break in and steal. And so our mindset, according to our King Yahweh, is the kingdom of God. This is why we pray. We pray for the kingdom to come. We're praying and rehearsing the Moedim. Because when we rehearse the Moedim, we're practicing what it's like to live in the kingdom. We are praying and expressing our faith that the kingdom should come. And so what should be our mindset? In the final passage of our studies, Colossians 3, 1 to 4, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you die to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Beloved brethren, the reason why money has an intoxicating effect on people. This is why people are so prone to worship it, to serve it, to, to trust it, and to love it. Is because they think all that there is to life is life here on earth. So all they think about is life here on earth. Yes, we should be responsible. Yes, we should address the problems we face on this earth. Yes, we need to do our duty as a father, as a mother, as a parent, as a husband, as a wife. Yes, we have responsibilities on earth. 
and we fulfill our duties on earth. But at the same time, we should set our sights in the realities of heaven. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of this earth. In other words, we live on earth, but we should live for heaven. And so our attitudes should reflect that. Our hearts should reflect that. Why? Because our real life is not for this earth. Our real life is who? It's Christ. It's Yahushua. So when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. That is our lesson. Let us stand and we shall pray together. Gracious Father, Yahuwah, thank you so much for the blessings that we have received. Thank you for imparting wisdom upon your people, teaching us how to manage our wealth in a way that is pleasing to you. We ask that you please bless your people all over the world. Help us that we might be able to fulfill our duties, especially towards the advancing of the kingdom. May you bless your people with jobs and livelihoods that will enable them to prosper. It is you who is the source of all good things. We ask that you please prosper your people all over the world. Yes, there's so much hardship and poverty going on. There are people losing their jobs. There are people who worry sometimes. Father, we turn to you, for we acknowledge you are our God. You are our Elohim, and your name is Yahuwah. And because you can be counted upon, we know that you can give us lovingly everything we can ever ask for. Our King, Yahusha, teach us to practice trust and faith. Help us to overcome the worries of life. Teach us to follow your steps each and every time we open our eyes to begin a new, a new day. Please strengthen our faith and guide all that we do and every decision and choice we make. Father, we believe that you have listened to our prayers. We ask and beg everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahusha Hamashiach. Amen. Okay, brethren, thank you so much for attending our Bible study for today. Uh, we do want to remind everyone our Four Beliefs Bible study is ongoing every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We do hope that you will uh, make the effort to really learn what we believe. That way, when people ask us what do we believe in and why do we have that hope, we have already the answer to give them. Also, we have upcoming August 25th, our second uh, part two of what happens after death. This is an open forum Bible study, which means uh, you get the opportunity to interact with me and also with our fellow brothers and sisters so that we can have uh, a Zoom, an interactive Zoom uh, Bible study where we can share our thoughts with one another. This is Sunday, August 25th at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That is all. May Yahweh Abba and Yahushua Hamashiach bless all of us.